We're flying to the moon on the new Atari Archive. Outer Space has been part of video games almost since their inception. One of the earliest computer games, Space War, came about in part because its designers were fans of pulpy science fiction stories. Space War went on to serve as inspiration for the first commercial arcade game, Computer Space, providing the first glimpse of the setting for public gaming consumption by having players shoot down UFOs within a time limit. The television series Star Trek inspired its own text-based computer game in 1971, with players jumping from sector to sector, seeking out Klingon ships. But 1977 would prove to be an inflection point for a couple reasons. First, on February 18th, NASA started its test flights of the Space Shuttle prototype Enterprise. The American space program hadn't done much since the final Skylab mission in 1973, beyond a largely PR-based link-up with the Soviet Soyuz capsule in 1975. The Enterprise marked the next phase in American manned spaceflight, and while it never achieved the same place in social consciousness as the Apollo moon landings, the shuttles were iconic in their own right. Perhaps most notably for video games, on May 25th, Star Wars came out in American movie theaters and became a smash hit. This not only revived outer space as a popular setting in science fiction media, it ended up becoming rather influential on video games for years to come, one example of which we'll be looking at a bit later. And finally, in July 1977, Atari released its Starship One arcade game. As far as I can tell, this was the very first video game to put you in a first-person cockpit perspective, and ended up serving as the progenitor of ideas that would appear multiple times over the next decade, both from Atari and from its competitors. The game itself resembles computer space, if played from a different angle. In Starship One, the player's goal is simply to shoot down enemy ships, which resemble store-brand Federation ships from Star Trek, while dodging their fire. Similar to computer space, players are on a timer, and by achieving a high enough score, they can get bonus time while in hyperspace to keep hunting down enemies. It's also one of the first games with an easter egg accessible by holding down the start and phaser buttons while inserting a coin, but only if a particular setting has been activated in the game. Launching nearly alongside Starship One was Starship on the VCS which served as a home conversion of the arcade game. Its designer, Bob Whitehead, was hired in January 1977 for the programming department, and Starship served as his first game on the platform. In an interview with Digital Press, Whitehead remarked that he was never assigned a game, suggesting that he selected this as one of his first assignments. Starship's primary game mode, called Space Wars, has essentially the same rules as its arcade counterpart. Players have 2 minutes and 16 seconds to destroy UFOs of differing point values by targeting them in the center of the screen and firing missiles at them. At the same time, the player has to avoid colliding with the alien ships or with indestructible groups of asteroids. Different game types adjust how fast the objects move and if they come one at a time or in groups of two. Changing the difficulty switch over will weaken your missiles and make alien ships more difficult to hit, making it necessary to hold them in your sights longer to shoot them down. Space Wars does include a two-player mode that puts one player in charge of a space module. The module can't fight back, it is worth two points if destroyed, but it has the option of turning invisible when it nears the targeting reticle of the other player. As such, the module commander's job is simply to avoid obstacles, which will give the other player points if collided with. After the timer is up, players switch roles, giving the second player a chance to outscore the first. Once the timer is up a second time, the game's finished. The second game mode on the card is Space Race, though it has nothing to do with Atari's 1973 arcade game. Instead of shooting down alien ships, the goal is to travel as far as you can within the 2 minute and 16 second time limit without colliding with asteroids. Each point represents a parsec traveled, and a collision will cause you to lose a parsec for some physics-defying reason. Instead of lasers, pushing the button on the controller will simply speed up the ship. The only game type differences are how many asteroid clumps appear at once, either one or two. The difficulty switches don't do anything in this game, nor is there a two-player mode. It's just you, some space rocks, and the open sky. The final game mode, Lunar Lander, is essentially a tag game, similar to the one in Indy 500. This game sees the player maneuvering a little Apollo-style lunar module around the screen to attempt a landing on the moon, which is drifting around on its own. Once the player approaches the moon, they push the button to fire retro rockets and attempt a landing. A successful landing gains the player a point and sends the moon off on another drifting path. 
mistiming the landing sequence will end up destroying the lander and costing a point, as will running into one of the meteors floating across the screen. The difficulty switches adjust how hard it is to actually touch down on the moon, and different game types will adjust the speed of the meteors. Similar to Space Wars, there is a two-player option included for Lunar Lander. The second player will take control of the moon and attempt to keep it away from the lunar module. After 2 minutes and 16 seconds, the roles reverse and the second player has to try and land on an uncooperative moon. Starship is a fairly middling entry in the initial VCS lineup. None of the game modes are bad, but none of them stand out. It does feature the innovative first-person cockpit view in two of the three game modes, which did end up influencing future games on the VCS and elsewhere. Unfortunately, it's easy to compare it against what came later, and the simplicity of Starship pales before the highly influential Star Raiders, released two years later on the Atari 8-bit computer line. Developers outside of Atari sought to improve upon the groundwork laid by Starship and Star Raiders. For example, Activision produced Star Master, and Star Path released Phaser Patrol for its supercharger VCS add-on. Both games featured Starship's first-person perspective and a variation of Star Raiders' seek out enemy ships on a galaxy map and destroy them gameplay. Imagic's Star Voyager, by comparison, hews far closer to Starship's gameplay, simply requiring players destroy a group of alien vessels before warping to the next level. Cockpit space shooters did exist on contemporary consoles to the VCS, though they came out well after Starship's debut. Unfortunately, there's no confirmation they were directly influenced by the game. The Channel F saw Galactic Space Wars come out in 1980, after the system and its rights had been sold by Fairchild to the company Zircon. This game requires players to seek out alien ships using X and Y coordinates and shoot them without taking hits themselves. More interestingly, RCA was working on a cockpit game called Star Wars. Yes, deliberately based on the movie, but apparently without any kind of official license. The game was in development for the unreleased Studio 3 game console, but is compatible with the Studio 2. RCA licensed out its Studio 3 technology in games overseas, and so Star Wars did end up seeing release in Europe and Australia. The game simply requires lining up a TIE fighter within the targeting reticule, at which point the game will automatically shoot it down and score a point. If the TIE goes off screen, it switches to its cockpit and targeting reticule, and has the player in an X-Wing trying to avoid getting shot down. This includes a two-player mode where one player is the X-Wing and the other is the TIE fighter, jockeying for position to avoid getting shot down and to shoot the opponent down. It's similar to Starship Space Wars two-player mode, but it's arguably more fun. While Star Wars may not have had anything to do with Starship, both games were harbingers of the space-themed games that would permeate early programmable game consoles. Whether it's just a matter of it being easy to create black backgrounds, the influence of Star Wars and science fiction media, or showing off programming tricks, outer space cropped up again and again on the VCS, its competitors, and in arcades. It's a trend that continues even up to the modern homebrew gaming era on the console. Despite my research, there are a few question marks around Starship's release. For starters, Starship seems to have gone through a name change while in development. Early press materials and advertisements refer to it as Space Mission, and at least one cart featuring just that label exists. Given that Starship One came out that summer as well, it makes me wonder if Space Mission had been a development title for the arcade game, but this is something I've been unable to say for sure. I also haven't been able to confirm whether or not Starship was a launch game under Atari's own branding, or whether or not it came along later in the fall. This actually will be the case for the next few games we look at. Atari's early advertisements and product reviews indicate that a few of the initial nine games in development were only expected to be out in stores by the end of 1977. In any case, the game was released by Sears as part of its September Telegames launch under the name Outer Space, and Atari continued to sell Starship into the early 80s before discontinuing it. Starship is not a particularly fun space mission on its own, but it's a starting point for absolute classics like Star Raiders, and as the first game on the platform for future Activision founder Bob Whitehead, it's hard to argue that it's a decent effort for a starting lineup. Next time, we'll be meeting a gambler in Blackjack.